Welcome to the next lecture in the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett. This lecture is on an introduction to Ethereum. It's the first of a series of lectures on Ethereum. Uh, similar to the other lectures, um, this slide deck includes um, materials that are under the Creative Commons license. And in fact, I'm actually leveraging materials from Andreas Antonopoulos and Gavin Wood's uh, GitHub site on the Mastering Ethereum. Um, so I'd like to thank Andreas and Gavin for providing their materials under this license. Uh, just a reminder, this, these the uh, lecture is gonna be a technical lecture. It's for educational purposes and it's not investment advice or legal advice. And this is not an endorsement of any particular blockchain project. So what are we gonna dive into? We're gonna talk about Ethereum. We'll talk about what is Ethereum. We'll talk about um, sort of the history of Ethereum. We'll talk about Ethereum's goal to be a general purpose blockchain. Um, we'll talk about it, the various components of the Ethereum blockchain. And we'll talk about this whole concept of decentralized applications and Web3. So what is Ethereum? Ethereum is often described as, a, as the world computer, but what does that mean? Let's start with a computer science focused description of Ethereum and then try to come up with a more practical analysis of Ethereum's capabilities and characteristics while comparing Ethereum to Bitcoin and other decentralized uh, information exchange platforms or blockchains. So from a computer science perspective, Ethereum is a deterministic but practically unbounded state machine consisting of a globally accessible singleton state and a virtual machine that applies changes to that state. From a more practical perspective, Ethereum is an open source, globally decentralized computing infrastructure that executes programs that are called smart contracts. It uses a blockchain to synchronize and store the system state changes along with a cryptocurrency called Ether to meter and constrain execution resource costs. The Ethereum platform enables developers to build powerful decentralized applications with built-in economic functions while providing high availability, auditability, uh, transparency, and neutrality. Uh, Ethereum can also reduce and eliminate censorship and reduce certain counterparty risks compared to traditional transactions. Uh, in a lot of ways, Ethereum is similar to Bitcoin, but it does have many other differences. Um, you know, and, and in fact, Bitcoin is the most popular uh, cryptocurrency. It was the very first cryptocurrency. And so many people will come to Ethereum with some prior knowledge of Bitcoin. So Ethereum has a number of common elements with the other open blockchains. Uh, it, Ethereum has a peer-to-peer -peer network connecting uh, participants. It's got a Byzantine fault-tolerant consensus algorithm for synchronization of state updates, you know, a proof-of-work blockchain, although they're in the process of moving to proof-of-stake. Um, Ethereum has uh, cryptographic primitives such as digital signatures and hashes, and it has this digital currency, Ether. Yet in many ways, both the um, purpose and construction of Ethereum are strikingly different from those of the open blockchains that preceded it, including uh, Bitcoin. Um, here's a look at, uh, at the Ether denominations in unit names. Um, Ether is the main currency, um, but it can be um, the smallest uh, subset of the currency would be Way. Um, there's actually 10 to 18 way for every uh, Ether. Um, and then there's some, some bigger currencies as well. Uh, so Ether, Ethereum's purpose is not, unlike Bitcoin, is primarily not intended to be a digital currency payment network. Instead, uh, Ether, Ethereum is designed to be a general purpose programmable blockchain that runs a virtual machine capable of executing software code. Um, so while the digital currency is necessary for the operation of Ethereum, Ether is really intended to be this utility currency to pay for the use of this Ethereum computing platform as the world computer. And the code that can be executed by this uh, Ethereum virtual machine is intended to be a lot more uh, complicated and capable than, for example, code that could be run in Bitcoin. Uh, 
you know, unlike Bitcoin, which is a very limited scripting language called Bitcoin Script, uh, Ethereum is designed to be this general purpose programmable blockchain. Uh, and Ethereum's uh, language is intended to be uh, Turing complete, meaning that Ethereum can function as a general purpose computer, including providing loops. Whereas uh, Bitcoin's language does not uh, permit loops and is intended focused on simple uh, evaluations of spending conditions. So let's take a look at the components of a blockchain. The components of an open block public blockchain include um, usually the following, a peer-to-peer -peer network, um, you know, connecting participants and sending transactions and blocks of verified transactions based on some sort of gossip protocol, messages in the form of transactions representing state transitions in, you know, allocating funds from one party to another, uh, a set of consensus rules governing what constitutes a transaction and what makes for a valid state trans transition, um, a state machine that processes the transactions according to the decentralized consensus rules, a uh, chain of cryptographically secured blocks that acts as a journal of all the verified and accepted state transitions uh, in terms of, you know, cryptocurrency being allocated from one party to another. Uh, a consensus algorithm de that decentralizes control over the blockchain by forcing participants to cooperate in the enforcement of the consensus rules. And a um, game theoretically sound incentivization scheme, for example, proof of work, cost, plus block rewards to economically secure the state machine in this open environment. And one or more open source uh, software implementations of the above, which would be, you know, clients that you could run to participate in the blockchain. Um, all or most of these components are usually combined in a single software client. For example, in Bitcoin, the reference implementation is developed by the Bitcoin Core open source project uh, and implemented as a Bitcoin D client. Uh, in Ethereum, rather than a reference implementation, there's a reference specification. Um, a mathematical description of that system is in the, yellow the Ethereum yellow paper. Um, there are a number of clients, which we'll be talking about later in um, subsequent, subsequent lectures, which are built according to the reference specification. That includes clients like Geth, the uh, Go Ethereum client, and the Parity client. Um, the term blockchain could be used to represent all the components just listed as a reference to the combination of technologies that include the characteristics of a blockchain. However, there are a huge variety of blockchains, many of which have different properties and don't have all of these components. Um, so it's helpful to have qualifiers to help understand the characteristics of a blockchain that you're dealing with, such as open or public or global or decentralized, because not every blockchain is open or public or global or decentralized. Um, so it's nice to have these qualifiers to help you identify what the characteristics of a blockchain system are that are provided by the system that you're dealing with. Um, not all blockchains are created equal. When someone tells you that something is a blockchain, you haven't really received an answer. Rather, you need to start asking a lot of questions to clarify by what they what do they mean when they use the word blockchain. Start by asking for a description of the components in the list, and then ask whether this blockchain has characteristics like open and public and so on. Um, So all great innovations are intended to solve real problems and Ethereum is no exception. Um, Ethereum was conceived at a time when people recognized the power of the Bitcoin model and they were trying to move beyond cryptocurrency applications. But the software developers faced a problem. They either needed to build on top of Bitcoin um, or start a new blockchain. Building upon Bitcoin meant living within the constraints of the Bitcoin protocol and trying to find workarounds. The limited set of transaction types, data types, and sizes of data storage for Bitcoin seemed to limit the sorts of applications that could be run directly in a Bitcoin ecosystem. Anything else needed additional off-chain layers, and that immediately negated some of the advantages of using a public blockchain like Bitcoin. 
for projects that needed more freedom and flexibility while staying on chain, a new blockchain was the only option. But that meant a lot of work, creating all the infrastructure elements, exhaustive testing, and so on. Towards the end of 2013, Vitalik Buterin uh, started thinking about further extending the capabilities of Bitcoin um, and MasterCoin, which is an overlay protocol that extended Bitcoin to offer uh, rudimentary smart contracts. So Vitalik proposed a more generalized approach to the MasterCoin team, one that allowed flexible and scriptable smart contracts to replace the specialized contract language of MasterCoin. While the MasterCoin team, team thought that was an impressive achievement, uh, the proposal was too radical a change to fit into uh, the MasterCoin roadmap. So in December 2013, Vitalik started sharing a white paper that outlined the idea behind Ethereum a Turing complete general purpose blockchain. Um, some of the early uh, people who saw that early draft gave feedback helping Vitalik evolve the proposal. Uh, So um, Gavin Wood joined up with Vitalik early on and Vitalik and Gavin refined and evolved the idea, basically uh, evolving Ethereum into a platform for building programmable money with blockchain based contracts that can hold digital assets and transfer them according to preset rules. And so, the, so Ethereum became this general purpose computing platform. Um, it started with several changes in emphasis and terminology, and later the influence became stronger with the incre increasing emphasis on Web3, which saw Ethereum as being one piece of a suite of decentralized technologies. So Ethereum's founders were thinking about a blockchain without a specific purpose, one that could support a broad variety of applications by being programmed. The idea was that by using a general purpose uh, blockchain, like Ethereum, a developer could program their particular application without having to implement the underlying mechanisms of peer-to-peer -peer networks, blockchains, and consensus algorithms, and so on. The Ethereum platform was designed to abstract these details and provide a deterministic and secure programming environment for decentralized blockchain applications. So much like uh, Satoshi, uh, Vitalik and Gavin Wood didn't just invent a new technology, they combined new inventions with existing technologies and delivered the prototype code to prove their ideas to the world. Um, and on July 30th, 2015, the first Ethereum block was mined uh, and the world's computer was up and running. So Ethereum's development was planned over several stages with major changes occurring at each stage. Um, the, the main development stages were codenamed Frontier, Homestead, Metropolis, and Serenity. Um, there have been a number of intermediate hard forks that have also occurred, including Ice Age, Dow, Tangerine Whistle, uh, Spurious Dragon, Byzantium, Constantinople, St. Petersburg, Istanbul, and Mer Glacier. Um, here's a look at an Ethereum timeline. So block zero is the initial stage of Ethereum that lasted from, you know, in the frontier stage, lasting from 2015 to 2016. Ice Age was a hard fork to introduce an exponential difficulty increase. Um, Homestead is a stage of Ethereum launched in March 2016. Um, around block 1192, they had a hard fork for the DAO which I'll talk about um, in a subsequent uh, video, but uh, the DAO was a hard fork that reimbursed victims of the hacked DAO contract and also caused Ethereum and Ethereum Classic to split into competing systems. Tangerine Whistle was a hard fork to change the gas calculation for IO heavy operations. Um, Spurious Dragon was a hard fork to address some denial of service attack vectors. 
Uh, also a replay attack protection mechanism. Metropolis Byzantium is the third stage of Ethereum, launched in 2017. Byzantium is the first part of Metropolis, uh, adjusting the block reward and difficulty. Uh, several future hard forks have been announced for Berlin and London, um, and they're part of the final stage of Ethereum development, um, can, can codename Serenity. Serenity involves a profound reorganization of the infrastructure that will make Ethereum more scalable, more secure, and more sustainable. Uh, it's presented as the second version of Ethereum, Ethereum 2.0. So, so let's talk a little bit more about Ethereum, a general purpose blockchain. So the original blockchain, namely Bitcoin's blockchain, tracks the state of units of Bitcoin and their ownership. You can think of Bitcoin as a distributed consensus state machine, where transactions cause a global state transition, altering who owns what coins. Uh, the state transitions are constrained by the rules of the decentralized consensus model, allowing all participants to eventually converge on a common consensus state of the system after several blocks are mined. Ethereum is also a distributed state machine, but instead of tracking only the state of currency ownership, uh, Ethereum tracks state transitions of a general purpose data storage. That is a data store that can hold any data expressible as a key value. Uh, key value data store holds arbitrary values, each referenced by some key. For example, um, the value of Ethereum can be referenced by the title currency. Uh, in some ways, this serves the same purpose as a data storage model of random access memory, or RAM, used by most general purpose computers. Ethereum has memory that stores both code and data, and it uses the Ethereum blockchain to track how this memory changes over time, like a general purpose stored program computer. Uh, Ethereum can load code into its state machine to run that code, restoring the resulting state changes in its blockchain. Two of the critical differences from most general purpose computers are that Ethereum state changes are governed by the rules of consensus and the state is attributed globally. Ethereum answers the question, what if we could track any arbitrary state and program the state machine to create a worldwide co computer operating under consensus? So in Ethereum, the components of a blockchain uh, include the following. Um, a peer-to-peer -peer network. Uh, Ethereum uh, runs on the Ethereum main network, which is addressable on a particular TCP IP port and runs, a, and runs a particular protocol. Consensus rules. Ethereum's consensus rules are defined in the reference specification, the, yellow, the Ethereum yellow paper. Uh, transactions. Ethereum transactions are network, me network messages that include, among other things, a sender, a recipient, a value, and a data payload. State machine. Uh, Ethereum state transitions are processed by the Ethereum virtual machine, uh, a stack-based virtual machine that executes bytecode. EVM programs called smart contracts are written in high-level languages like Solidity and compiled to bytecode for execution on the EVM. From a data structures perspective, Ethereum state is stored locally on each node as, as a database, uh, usually Google's level DB, which contains the transactions and system state in a serialized hash data structure called a Merkle Patricia tree. Consensus algorithm, Ethereum uses Bitcoin's consensus model, Nakamoto consensus, which uses sequential single signature blocks weighted on importance by proof of work to determine the longest chain and therefore the current state. However, there are plans to move to a proof of stake voting system code named Casper in the near future. Economic security, Ethereum currently uses a proof of work algorithm called ETH hash, but this will eventually be dropped with the move to proof of stake. Uh, clients, Ethereum has several interoperable implementations of client service, client software, the most prominent of which is the Go Ethereum guest client and parity. So comment about Ethereum in turn complete. You'll sometimes, uh, when you start here reading about Ethereum, you'll hear the word turn completeness mentioned. Um, Ethereum, they say, unlike Bitcoin, is turn complete. Well, what does that mean? So the term turn complete refers to English mathematician Alan Turing, who is considered the father of computer science. 1936, he created a mathematical model of computer consisting of a state machine to manipulate symbols by reading and writing them on sequential memory. 
resembling an infinite length paper tape. With this construct, Turing went on to provide a mathematical foundation to answer questions about universal computability, meaning whether all problems are solvable. He proved that there are classes of problems that are not computable. Specifically, he proved that the halting problem, whether it's possible given an arbitrary program's input to determine whether the program will eventually stop running, is not solvable. He further defined a system to be Turing complete if it can be used to simulate any Turing machine. Such a system is called a universal Turing machine. Ethereum's ability to execute a stored program in a state machine called the Ethereum virtual machine while reading and writing data to memory makes Ethereum a Turing complete system and therefore one of these uh, Turing universal Turing machines. Uh, Ethereum can compute any algorithm that can, that can be computed by any Turing machine given the, limit, given the limitations of finite memory. So Ethereum's groundbreaking innovation is to combine the general purpose computing architecture of a stored program computer with a decentralized blockchain, thereby creating a distributed single state, singleton world computer. Ethereum programs run everywhere, you know, on all the nodes in the Ethereum blockchain, yet produce a common state that is secured by the rule of consensus. So hearing that Ethereum is Turing complete, you might arrive at the conclusion that the feature is somehow lacking in a system that is Turing incomplete. Rather, it's the opposite. Turing completeness is relatively easy to achieve. Um, however, Turing completeness can be dangerous, particularly in open access systems like public blockchains, because of the halting problem that we mentioned earlier. For example, modern printers are Turing complete and can be given files to print that could send them into a frozen state. The fact that Ethereum is Turing complete means any program can be of any complexity can be computed by Ethereum. But that flexibility brings security and resource management problems. An unresponsive printer can be turned off and turned back on again. But what will you do with a public blockchain? What if all 10,000 nodes get uh, in a block, public blockchain are impacted? So Turing proved that you can't predict whether a program will terminate by simulating on a computer. In simple terms, we can't predict the path of a program without running it. So Turing complete systems can have uh, suffer from a, a bug of an infinite loop, um, describing a program that doesn't terminate. Um, unintended never ending loops can arise without warning due to in complex interactions between starting conditions and the software code. In Ethereum, this poses a challenge. Every participating node must validate every transaction running any smart contracts it calls. But since Ethereum can't predict if a smart contract will terminate or how long it will run without actually running it, and potentially therefore falling in an infinite loop and running forever, so how do we handle this problem? Um, you know, if there's a smart contract that has a potential infinite loop in it, because this would essentially be a denial of service attack on the network if the entire network is brought down by one of these infinite loops. Um, and there are many other possible errors that could happen as well. Resource hogging, memory uh, bloating, CPU overheading programs that waste resources. And But if you have a world computer running the same programs on thousands and thousands of nodes, inefficient programs are a real problem, even if they're not infinite loops. So how does Ethereum constrain the resources used by the smart contract if it can't predict the resource use in advance? So to answer this challenge, Ethereum introduces a metering mechanism called gas. As the Ethereum virtual machine executes a smart contract, it accounts for every instruction, computation, data access, and so on. Each instruction has a predetermined cost in units of gas. When a transaction triggers the execution of a smart contract, it must include an amount of gas that sets the upper limit of what can be consumed running the smart contract. The Ethereum virtual machine will terminate execution if the amount of gas consumed by computation exceeds the gas available in the transaction. Gas is a mechanism Ethereum uses to allow Turing complete computation while limiting the resources that any program can consume. So how does one get gas to pay for computation on the Ethereum world computer? Uh, you won't find gas on a cryptocurrency exchange. Instead, it's purchased as part of a transaction and can only be brought with, bought with Ether. 
Ether needs to be sent along with a transaction, and it needs to be explicitly earmarked for the purchase of gas, along with an acceptable gas price. Just like at a pump at a fueling station, the price of Ethereum's gas is not fixed. Gas is purchased for the transaction, computation is executed, and any used unused gas is refunded back to the center of the transaction. Ethereum was started as a way to make general purpose blockchain that could be programmed for a variety of uses, but very quickly Ethereum's vision expanded to become a platform for programming decentralized applications or dApps. DApps represent a broader perspective than smart contracts. A DApp is, at the very least, a smart contract and a web user interface. More broadly, a DApp is a web application that's built on top of open decentralized peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure services. A DApp is composed of at least smart contracts on a blockchain and a web front-end user interface. In addition, many DApps include other decentralized components, such as a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer storage protocol and platform, and a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer messaging protocol and platform. Um, and along with DApps, we've heard of the phrase Web uh, 3, or the third age of the internet. You know, in the early 2000s, the term uh, Web 2.0, uh, came about describing an evolution of the web towards user generated content, responsive interfaces, and interactivity uh, with portals and Facebook and so forth. Um, so, Web 2.0 wasn't really a technical specification, but rather a term describing the early 2000s focus on web applications. So, the concept of DApps is meant to take the uh, World Wide Web to its next evolutionary stage, introducing decentralization with peer to peer protocols into every aspect of the web application. The term used to describe this evolution is Web 3, meaning the third version of the web. Uh, Web3 represents a new vision and focus for web applications from centrally owned and managed applications to applications built on decentralized protocols. Um, so Web3 often uses a Web3.js JavaScript library, which, which will bridge JavaScript applications that run in your browser with the Ethereum blockchain. Um, so let's talk about Ethereum's development culture. So far, we've talked about how Ethereum's goals and technologies differ from those of the other blockchains that preceded it, like Bitcoin. Ethereum also has a very different development culture. In Bitcoin, development is guided by conservative principles. All changes are carefully studied to ensure that none of the existing systems are disrupted by a new change. For the most part, changes in Bitcoin are only implemented if they are backwards compatible. Existing clients are allowed to opt in, but will continue to operate if they decide not to upgrade. In Ethereum, by comparison, the community's development culture is focused on the future rather than the past. Uh, Ethereum has, to a certain extent, copied Facebook's mantra on moving fast and breaking things. If a change is needed, uh, it is implemented even if that means invalidating prior assumptions breaking compatibility or forcing clients to update. Ethereum's development culture is characterized by rapid innovation, rapid evolution, and a willingness to deploy forward-looking improvements, even if this is at the expense of some backward compatibility. What this means is that as a developer, developers need to remain flexible and be prepared to rebuild their infrastructure as some of the underlying assumptions change. One of the changes challenges facing developers in Ethereum is an inherent contradiction between deploying code to a mutable system while the development platform is still evolving. You can't simply upgrade your smart contracts. You must be prepared to deploy new ones, migrate users, apps, and funds, and start over. This also means that the goal of building systems with more autonomy and less centralized control is still not fully realized. Autonomy and decentralization requires a bit more stability in the platform than Ethereum is likely to have for the next few years. In order to evolve the platform, you have to be ready to scrap and restart your smart contracts, which means you have to retain a certain amount of control over those smart contracts. But on the positive side, Ethereum is moving very fast. There's little opportunity uh, for holding up development by arguing over minor details, such as, you know, um, Eventually, the development of the 
Ethereum platform will slow down and its interfaces will become fixed. But in the meantime, innovation is the driving principle. So why learn Ethereum? Blockchains have a very steep learning curve as they combine multiple disciplines into one domain. Programming, computer security, cryptography, economics, distributed systems, peer-to-peer -peer networks, and so on. Ethereum makes the learning curve less steep so you can get started quickly. But just below the surface of a deceptively simple environment lies a lot of depth. As you learn to start looking deeper, there's always another layer of complexity. Ethereum is a great platform for learning about blockchain and it's building a massive community of developers faster than any other blockchain platform. More than any other, Ethereum is a developer's blockchain built by developers for developers. A developer familiar with JavaScript applications can drop into Ethereum and start producing working code very quickly. Um, you know, in the early years of Ethereum's life, it was common to see t-shirts announcing that you can create a token and just a few lines of software code. Of course, that's a double-edged sword. It's easy to write code, but it's very hard to write good and secure code. There are a lot of areas where you can read about um, Ethereum in much greater detail. Here's some links. We'll be providing more links uh, later on. But uh, Ethereum, there's a lot of places where you can look to learn more about Ethereum, as well as I'll be providing a number of different le lectures, probably at least 20 to 30 lectures diving into detail on Ethereum following this lecture. Um, so this introductory lecture just kind of talked about Ethereum at a very high level. We talked about the fact that Ethereum is an open source, globally decentralized computing infrastructure that executes programs called smart contracts. Uh, Ethereum uses a blockchain to synchronize and store the system state changes along with a cryptocurrency called ETH to meter and constrain the execution resource costs. We talked about the fact that the Ethereum platform enables developers to build powerful decentralized applications with built-in economic functions. And we talked about the fact that Ethereum's currency Ether is intended as a utility currency to pay for use of the Ethereum platform as a world computer, as opposed to a currency on its own, which was really what Bitcoin was intended to be. Finally, we talked about the fact that Ethereum is designed to be a general purpose programmable blockchain that runs a virtual machine capable of executing code uh, of arbitrary and unbounded complexity. So thanks for uh, watching this introduction to Ethereum lecture, uh, part of the Understanding Crypto Series by Thomas Plunkett. We will have uh, subsequent lectures on Ethereum uh, in the next few weeks.